Yes, thank you so much for being here, brother. No, oh, it's a pleasure, Rafat. Thank you. Now, Matthias, you are a teacher of cosmic sexuality. I know you are an alchemist as well. You're an author and entrepreneur. But I've invited you here to teach and to share with us a bit of your knowledge on, on and around Tantra. Um, so as much as throughout this conversation, I'm sure we're going to be talking about you, your past, your present, and the goals that you have for, for your future, um, I love to start conversations with um, some sort of agreement on vocabulary. And what I, if it's okay with you, what I'm going to ask you, you to do first is to tell us what is Tantra and anything else that we need that you think will be useful for us both listeners and the two of us discussing now for the first time Tantra what else do we need to know about Tantra that's going to facilitate our conversation definitely so Tantra as um, a meeting as it came over from the East. So a lot of people associate it with sting and having sex for like 12 hours. That's where it's traditionally defined of, of this long-term sexual uh, contact within my practice and how I teach Tantra is understanding the weave of the masculine and feminine energies or the alpha and omega energies that permeate society and permeate existence. So it's all about the weave and being tantric in nature is going with that flow and weaving those energies into your day-to-day -day lives and deep into your intimate connections, but not just in the bedroom, but with all things. So you can live tantrically and sensually and connected to the experience of being a human in this existence. So tantra, when I use that word, it's that weaving and the connecting of consciousness and intimacy of the masculine and feminine energies and masculine and feminine energies. I like to define that as both the giving and receiving energy, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times it's considered with gender, but the way that you look at it is in this conversation, the context, when I say masculine, it is the energy of giving or moving forward or leading and feminine in receptivity, receiving or following mm -hmm. or responding. No, amazing. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've obviously been doing and, and watching quite a bit of, of Tantra centric videos in books. And the first thing that a lot of them mention is that Tantra is not sex per se. And I'm, I'm you know, you've, you've brought that this down beautifully and that it's a, it's a, a, a much bigger system, a much bigger school of thought than just, um, you know, the 12 hour sex sessions, so to speak. So whilst yeah, we those are fun too, though, it's a fun too, right? And we, <laughs> those are fun we, too. <laughs> we shall speak of that for sure, but understanding that it's a whole um, personal development system, yes, be very much be explored outside of the bedroom. Amazing. So, pardon me, you do work with people, both couples, individuals, and groups. Am I correct? Correct. Mm. Yeah. So it doesn't matter, you know, everyone can deepen their intimacy. You know, that's, that's something that unfortunately isn't trained in society. So yeah, I work with everyone. Mm. My, my first question in relation to that was actually going to be, are there any prerequisites that you ask people to, to come with? You know what? It's usually not, um, it's not prerequisites of knowledge, but mm. it more or less an agreement. Right. So before someone meets, there's usually an agreement that that takes place. Um, and with that, it's usually understanding in order to grow. Mm -hmm. And especially in these different areas, this is part of the alchemy that I introduce them to is nothing of value can be obtained without something of equal value being lost. And that value might just be a perception in which you hold. So you might have to hold you might hold a, a perception that's very valuable to you. But in giving that up, you can get something of equal or greater value once it's transmuted. So the big thing is coming with the agreements to kind of soften the belief systems and to experiment, to play, but to know that you may have to exchange certain th things and often they're belief systems. So you mm -hmm. might have to exchange those in order to experience the depth that you're craving. I see. Open-mindedness, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So some people um, are reluctant to do that. And in that, then I let them know, it's like, I, I can't help you, you know, because there's, and some people are serious about, you know, there there's certain beliefs, mm -hmm. but those beliefs actually lead to certain outcomes. Yeah. And I'm here to help people facilitate their greatest or, or deeper intimate 
outcomes. So you have to, you have to be more fluid. You have to be more flexible. The mm -hmm. rigidity of life it does not service you if you're not having the results that you want. You need to be able to change. So, um, yeah, so that's usually the thing. It's not the prerequisite, but the agreement and the openness to experience something new and be willing to apply yourself. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. I find myself as a coach that, um, while well, my understanding is that we are the sums of the stories we tell about ourselves. And by the time someone comes to you for a bit of guidance towards a, a different them, a different way of going about it, they're going to have to change that story or their stories. And with that, at times comes a lot of, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, refusal to simply change and uh and even acknowledge that something needs to actually change in order for growth to take place a hundred percent often that is i mean there's anxiety because they associate their beliefs with their identity where they're not there you go you yeah. know and that's one of the things is helping people separate that to to say you could believe whatever you want to believe mm -hmm. and you can believe that your beliefs that you have right now are based on your experiences if you had different experiences you would have had different beliefs these are not these are not necessarily core structures of the universe, mm -hmm. belief systems. You know, they're very much given to us or painted by us. So as you said that, you know, they, they have to play a certain role, or they're used to playing a certain role. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I really teach is that you're not only the actor in your script, in the movie, mm -hmm. but you're also the director, the writer, and the editor. Yeah. So you have many, many roles and sometimes the composer if you're doing music, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes you might have soundtracks for life. So mm -hmm. understanding your role and responsibility as each of those members of the production mm -hmm. of your life is important and powerful. But a lot of people don't come from that place of power and to adopt such power comes with great responsibility. It's one of my favorite quotes you know, from Spider-Man, from my mm -hmm. nerd lineage, and then yeah, uh, yeah. with <laughs> Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when people start understanding how powerful they are, they'll usually back off and deny it so they don't have to be responsible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you within the realm of dating and connecting with new people, how do you go about coaching people in letting go of that resistance? Yeah, so I, I tell people, first of all, don't date. Okay. R rule number one, don't date. And the reason why is because I consider dating now primitive dating rituals. They're primitive and they're outdated. And most people are not necessarily functioning within the adult approach to dating. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, the dating we learned in high school. So we learned that, okay, you do, you show interest in a girl. She might play hard to get. Here's this little game. You keep showing interest. You do these different things to arouse her emotions. Now she's starting to get emotional connected. And now you uh, uh, try to facilitate a deepening intimacy and possibly a sexual connection that shows that there's intimacy and connection. Mm -hmm. And nowadays it doesn't necessarily lead to marriage. That's usually a point of disconnection for a lot of people is, is the pursuit of sex. Mm -hmm. And in that, I, I tell people to start from scratch and that's meeting people mm -hmm. like, you know, I'd like to meet you. I'd like to get to know you. Don't date someone, meet mm -hmm. someone. You know, yeah. when you, when you find somebody that you enjoy something with, you meet somebody that you find that is interested in sports. You find somebody that's interested in spirituality, yoga, traveling, camping, hiking. You don't immediately make this, you know, agenda. What you look for is that connection to say, mm -hmm. Hey, how does this feel first and foremost and, and check into that. And so I said, tell people like, don't go in with an agenda, just say, Hey, if you meet someone online, say, Hey, you're pretty cool. You're interesting. I, you know, we had a nice conversation on zoom, whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's meet. Yeah. Let's meet. Let's just meet for coffee. Let's just see how the conversation goes and feels and then continue to meet somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. Because once you meet somebody and you spend time doing things without the agenda, you're able to actually get to know the person instead of project your agenda onto the person in which we, so many of us do in dating. And that's a traditional role. Yeah, you project cool. you, you to feel, fill a gap for me. Yeah. I, I'm looking for sex. I'm looking for you to fill that, that gap as a sexual partner. I'm looking for a relationship. I want you to fill that gap as my partner. 
Where is if you go into meeting, you're seeing how can we complement each other's lives? Are we enjoying the time that we spend together? Mm -hmm. Does this feel good? Do we want to do more of this? And then when you get to the point where you've had enough sessions where you're like, you know, this person is great. You know, I just, I love spending time with this person. It doesn't matter if we are being intimate. It doesn't matter if we are just hanging around laughing. If if we can work next to each other, we can, we can study, we can read silently. I just like being in this person's presence. Yeah. You know what? Now let's start making agreements. And that's where I say, don't, don't date, make agreements, Mm -hmm. right? So you can look someone eye to eye and say, you know what? Let's agree to only see each other if monogamy is your thing. Like, let, let's agree not to bring other energies and sexual energies into this space so we can hone what we have here. Mm-hmm. Can we agree to that? And if we want to change that, that that's totally changeable. Mm-hmm. Everything is changeable. But let's start with these foundations that help support what we're creating. And people don't do that. They don't have firm agreements that they are like, yes, that feels good. Mm-hmm. Right there, There's these unspoken agreements that create this codependency and these different bonds that only feel bad when they're broken, but they don't feel good that they're held within. Yeah. Yeah. A simple, I enjoy your company to start with. I get it. Yeah. I mean, because think about how beautiful that is with your best friends. Mm-hmm. You never had to say we're dating or we're friends now. Yeah. You would just call them up, invite them to do an activity, enjoy that activity. And because you both felt good about spending time together, you could easily call each other and say, hey, do you want to do something else? And the answer becomes yes, Mm -hmm. because you enjoy that time. You don't have to make the calculation. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What does that mean? I hear you. So let's go into sex then, because that Mm -hmm. seems to be the power, the, the, the force that changes everything, where now agenda comes into play, expectations, at times a sense of entitlement. It changes the dynamics of one's relationship with someone else. Um, what is in your um, in your experience the, the 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 safest, or I should say, the wisest way to go from? Okay, I enjoy the 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 company of you, and I'm hoping that you enjoy mine too. Could we possibly delve into something that's a bit more sacred now than just the coffee? Definitely. <laughs> Coffee to sex. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But without question, I mean, the big thing is when you're transitioning into anything in life is to clarify your agreements. What does mm-hmm. that mean to you? What does it mean to the other person? And one of the most important things that you can communicate to another person, right? A lot of mm-hmm. times we talk about intentions in the world of spirituality, but one of the big things to communicate is what do you care to experience? Right? And this is a big question that I ask all the time is what do you care to experience in this realm? Right. And so for a lot of people, it might be, you know, I'm just looking for an orgasm. I'm, I'm just mm-hmm. looking to get off. Yeah. I'm looking for partnership. I'm looking for a deeper experience. Um, but a lot of people just don't even ask. They just are feeling good and then they progress. What I, I like to do and what I, you know, coach people to is the understanding that keeping that mystery is very powerful initially, energetically, like, Ooh, mm-hmm. I don't know what they're saying and all that mystery and all that arousal. And I'll just take that into the bedroom and then something will happen magically. And then boom, we had sex and it might've been amazing. It might've been awful, mm-hmm. but all that mystery it w- was there to charge it. What I often tell people is remove that. Mm-hmm. Talk about it, neutralize all of it. Because once it's all neutralized, then you can meet people on what is real, what is real from their heart's desire, what it is that they feel safe with, what are their concerns moving into that space. And then from there, you can start building. Oh, you don't feel really safe. Well, let's go slow. Mm. You've had bad experiences. That's fine. Let's take it slow. Mm. I want I want to feel you getting more comfortable. Yeah. Right. So to make that transition into sex, it's first get rid of the mystery then start communicating the experiences you both are looking for. Mm. And in that communication, now you can start arousing fantasy. You can start arousing and communicating the mentality of moving into the space in which when I speak, it creates a response in my partner. Does that create just arousal within them as I talk about my approach to it? Mm. When they talk about their approach to me, does that feel good? Even as we run through it mentally now, as we talk about it, is it feeling good? Are we feeling safe? Are we feeling relaxed? Are we feeling connected? Yeah. Well, if that's a foundation, you might, might feel good enough to progress, but without that 
communication about experience, you usually have two people, two different agendas that, you know, one wants sex and then something else, and then somebody wants sex and that's it. And all that creates a lot of pain and suffering when it's not communicated. Yeah. I'm now thinking, almost thinking like the devil's advocate, where mm. I'm thinking that a lot of people actually don't know what they want. A lot of ah. us pretend that we do, <laughs> but you know what I mean? You meet someone mm -hmm. and especially if you start with the idea that I want sex only or I just want a friend and then you meet that person and it's the other way around like I don't just want to be friend I want sex with this person or I thought I wanted sex but actually I want this person to be a friend that is besides the the, the first point I made which was perhaps you don't even know what you want um, but I think that reinforces the uh, the first point you made to say don't date just yet figure out not only the, the other person but figure yourself out within this transaction so to speak within within this relationship Am yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. yeah definitely i mean because when you when you have that you might have the intent to have sex as you know i thought that i would have a certain attraction to people and upon meeting them i was like oh i don't have that type of attraction with them i don't mm -hmm. and then i've met people that i'm like oh you know what they're nice and i see them in this light of you know friends or spiritual companions in in a deeper way, mm -hmm. but I don't see them in that sexual light. But yeah. then over time in meeting and spending time and connection, then it becomes apparent that, oh, this connection does facilitate deeper intimacy. And it has a foundation of all these good things that other relationships don't, mm. you know, but it's through that time and, and it's through the lens of clarity and the truth of who that person is and who I am and how we relate in our honest connection with each other versus my projection of this person to be someone to fill a gap within my life or to fill a need for me. It's something that we share instead of it's, it's some, not the, something that exchanges, it's something that is melded together and builds each other up. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you for that. Now yeah. I've got five different little chapters that I've got questions for you. Um, Great. About, and I'm going to give them to you there in no particular order. But I, I, I want you to start me anytime that one of them feels like, let's talk about this first. The first one is about breath and intention. And obviously those are going to be related to, let's say you've met someone with whom you can take it a little further than a cup of coffee. Um, number one, breath and intention. I mentioned there was no number, so I'm just going to say <laughs> visualization and manifesting, sex and sublimation sensual touch and soul gazing and lastly sacred space god and magic do any of these titles sub chapters inspire you all of them all of them um, but where i would start would be the intention and visualization mm -hmm. that to me is the core of reality right uh, in many of the spiritual practices we talk about the third eye and the pineal Mm -hmm. Right. And within that is a space where all imagination is experienced. You're able to close your eyes and visualize the life that you want to live. You're able to see yourself getting out of bed, even if you couldn't walk. It's a magical, powerful place. And us athletes know it and know it well. Like, so if you've experienced yourself as an athlete, one of the things that we do in visualization is seeing yourself doing what it is if you're going to be breaking an, a, a record of some mm -hmm. type, if you're going to be doing better than you ever did in one of your lifts, if you're weightlifting, or if you're in competition, you see yourself winning, you see yourself successful, and that ability of visualization drives your actions to match what it is that you see. Mm -hmm. So seeing yourself and projecting a light upon yourself to form the character that you want to be and constantly fill that with more light and that intention of vision, right? that internal light that you're filling that, or, you know, in some cases we refer to it as divine light, mm -hmm. is that light of consciousness to be wrapped in the behaviors, the habits, and the lifestyle that you desire and the person that you want to be, mm -hmm. to me, is the core of everything. I see as a goal towards congruence, basically. Wow. Yeah. You know, the, the no vision, no victory yeah. is, a, is a common, you know, term amongst, you know, executives as well as athletes and, and anybody who's competing or building something. No mm -hmm. vision, no victory. 
right? So that vision is the driving force behind all of your actions, yeah. at least in the term of the masculine, right? So that's another thing too, within the masculine. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. I was going to mention it because now I feel that we need to break down the difference between vision and agenda. And mm -hmm. we talked before about, you know, doing our best to minimize how much of an agenda we are going to push on whoever we meet for the first time. Whilst having the same time, if you have a solo practice or if you're getting into a relationship with someone, developing this capacity, as you said, to have a vision for a victory, a victory of some sort. Can I press you on, on the vision aspect of what one would want? And we can perhaps go into the polarities as to the female, I'm sorry, feminine and masculine aspect yeah, of what vision is. Definitely. So vision, right? It, and you mentioned vision and, and agenda. Mm -hmm. right? So agenda is when you're trying to, when, you know, and, and an agenda might just be a checklist of things that you want done. Yeah. That's on our agenda for today. It's not necessarily a bad thing, mm -hmm. but in the context of relating, usually, oh, I feel like this person has an agenda, mm -hmm. meaning that they're trying to steer me into a direction of their path, regardless of what my what's my truth and my desires. Mm -hmm. Coercion, mm -hmm. right? It's coercion um, or compliance. They're trying to have me comply with them, and it's not something that I'm, I'm willing to do. Um, so in that, vision is more about you. Right, and what you want to experience. Agenda is necessarily more about how you want to move other people. Mm -hmm. When you can just communicate your vision clearly, the idea is that you're making offers, right? You're not trying to co coerce somebody or manipulate them. Mm -hmm. With your vision, you're sharing your vision, and then people are recruited or inspired by your vision to join you on that path or may want to experience the same things. So that vision resonates with something within them that feels good, and now you guys are in like vibration. There's harmony. Those vibrations match, and you harmonize in this vision that's there, yeah. right? And in and, and agenda it doesn't really matter. You don't, they're not looking for harmony. You're looking for compliance and obedience. It's like, yeah. I need to get this done. This is what I'm trying to go for. And, and this is anyone. often, mm -hmm. yeah. And this can be anyone and yeah. this can be from a, a male body, female body, or any gender body. Everybody can have an agenda, but mm -hmm. it's how you experience it and how you present it. So vision is more recruiting people to harmonize with you and align with you. Agenda as I've seen it is more or less, I'm doing this regardless of you and I, and I will happily manipulate you outside of your comfort zone to meet my agenda. I hear you. I hear you. But, and, and one of the other things in, in vision, and this goes in, in the masculine and feminine energies with alpha, the leading following um, energetic. And so you think of it more of a, as a dance mm. leading and following necessarily than, than the masculine is up here. Feminine is on here. If you, if you look at that as leading and following or alpha and omega is something that Justin Patrick Pierce and um, his wife, London uh, talk about. And she wrote the awakened woman's guide to um everlasting love mm -hmm. they're an amazing couple they teach tantra and really sacred uh, relationships and they talk about the alpha and omega and i think they do it probably better than anybody that i've read in my practice in that communication uh, along with david detta in understanding the, the masculine and feminine so i encourage anybody who's interested to go and, and research them a little bit yeah. more but i i see the feminine when it comes to vision that is one thing often that the feminine is um is more responsive to and not necessarily leads with. I see. Right. And I don't want to say lacking, but it's often lacking. It's just not necessarily there. Where the feminine is looking for often an emotional response to some type of input. Mm. Right. They're looking to feel something first. That's why they are looking to be approached by men. And they're not going out and saying, oh, I see these just some characteristics of a man. Let me reach out to him. Let me continue communicating. They often get uncomfortable by that idea. Yeah. Right? So in that, they're looking to actually have vision presented to them. Mm. Right. And or they'll start seeing a man with vision. They'll see how he's living his life. And now they'll want to harmonize to that. Mm -hmm. And that is often in the, you know, a traditional feminine, uh, feminine role. But it also feels really good as well. Mm. So women, women often, you know, are, are looking to be around a man with uh, leadership and vision and power and strength and, and direction. And those things are often create attraction 
because the woman, not necessarily having a vision for a man, the man has a vision for family, has a vision for his life. And that is something usually that creates a resonance and a harmony within the woman that says, oh, I would like to, I like to be with this man. That vision resonates with me. Yeah. So it's, it's a different type of uh, visioning, you know, that's mm -hmm. not necessarily projected, but it's more felt within the feminine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more and it's an attractive. Yeah. And it becomes an attractive force. It's yes. true having a vision for one's life as opposed to having ideas as to what you want in your bed or anywhere else um, in the present moment is a very, very powerful way to go about it. I, 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 amazing. Thank you, Matthias. Um, we talked about intention and visualization. I'm tempted to go into... Breath. Breath and ma manifesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Breath and manifesting. So one, uh, my teacher, Jim Self, Roxanne Burnett of Mastering Alchemy had a, a saying, and that's infinite intelligence is within the breath. Mm. Right. And being able to follow your breath, you follow consciousness. It's one of the things is you can tell where your consciousness is by your style of breathing. Yeah. You know, excitement comes with a certain physiological response within the body. You're going to talk a little bit faster. You're excited. If you're fearful, you're going to be short of breath. Mm -hmm. If you're relaxed and you're grounded, you're able to breathe easy. You go on vacation and you finally get hit with those rays of sun and you're, you're on the beach. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you get that breath. Yeah. So there's, there's an intelligence to it, even without words or thoughts is a breath patterning carries an intelligence. And in many of the meditation practices that I do, I look to breathe until the breath breathes you. Where yeah. you feel that the breath and that intelligence of the breath is moving through you and activating you instead of you breathing it, it's breathing you. Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful emotional component. It's a powerful com emotional controller. If you're going to adjust the way that you're feeling, calm down, take a deep breath. You know, these things are, are ha actually have a physiological response to our nervous system and our entire body. So I, I definitely encourage anybody to do that, even little practices of you know, taking 10 deep breaths, <sighs> slow breaths. And another thing is breathing into the fullness of the lungs and mm. into the belly. A lot of us can't even do it here in the West, out in America, is everybody's breathing in their chest, they're up and down. They can't breathe in and out. The yogic breath, that deep yeah. ujjayi, right? That's, that's a big deep breath. So... That's what I have to say about, about breath and for manifestation that goes hand in hand with what we were talking about in vision, you know? So if you're looking to manifest, but there's two components to manifestation, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's the thoughts and this is where, you know, I, I tell people the secret had it half right. Right. Okay. Yeah. There's the thoughts and thoughts in their essence are electrical. They're electrical impulses. So you have a thought, you can see different parts of the mind, the brain, that are activated and firing when you're thinking, but it's incomplete. That's an incomplete system. That's kind of the masculine system. Mm -hmm. When you have a thought and it's neutral, it's just an electrical current. The real power is when you have thought as well as emotion. Yeah. Right. That's what creates these two universal forces, electromagnetism. These are universal forces within play of creation of reality is you want your thoughts and your emotions to align, mm. right? Because you don't want to have, and, and let me give you an example. This is an example I, I often teach when I'm teaching my Genesis protocols and Phoenix protocols to help people rebirth into their, their cells and to understand is if you take a look in at electromagnets, these are a great example. You have a magnet. And then you wrap, and this is a simple term. So all my science nerds, come, you know, come talk to me later. But <laughs> in, in the simplicity, you have a magnet. And that just has one times magnetism, right? You just, it has the magnetic force that it, it has. You put a copper wire around it and you run the current through that. You get one times magnetism. You wrap it around twice, you get two times magnetism. You wrap it around a thousand times, you get a thousand times magnetism when you're running that current through there. 
and you have that copper wire wrapped around that magnetic and you're, you're running that electrical system. Now, if you're running in the opposite direction, now it has a repulsion. Right. So if you think about that, your thoughts being electrical, your emotions being magnetic, you want those in alignment, mm -hmm. meaning that if you're thinking about being successful on the job interview, but you feel terrible, you feel a lack of confidence It's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm thinking the, the, the secret told me to think about this. I, I'm supposed to think positive thoughts, think positive thoughts. And your emotion is the magnet turned the other way, but mm -hmm. you keep charging it anyway. Well, you're just going to get further and further away. But if you're thinking that and you feel it like, oh, yeah, no, I see myself getting that job feels really good. I've, I've been wanting to work for this company for a long time. This feels really, really good. You go in with that. They're going to feel like, oh, wow, this person feels good about being mm -hmm. here. It has a different resonance yeah. that the human physiological nervous system can actually feel. It's part of our six, seven senses that no one talks about, but we experience them. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's where manifestation comes in is having your thoughts and your emotions. You want to be wealthy. You want to think positive thoughts about generating wealth and positive emotions. You want to, you want to feel good be, being wealthy. You want to feel good, you know, having the lover that you have. You want to feel good. You want to feel bad. You need to feel good if you're going to have good thoughts about it. Yeah. Yeah. Practically speaking, because, I, and don't get me wrong, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I end up using the word positive fairly often as well. Um, but what comes back to me often is how, when one feels like shit, how yeah. do you go about switching that? I mean, I'm sure we can go back to the breath. We talked about it before, breath work practices, physical practices, somatic practices in order to somehow be able to retune into a, a positive self. But what is it that you advise, uh, yeah. that you advise your, your people to, to switch off from that negative feeling about themselves? Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that we worked on for years in mastering alchemy is mastering the parts of yourself that you can master, mm -hmm. right? And and so we're taught to look at all these different external functions of the world, like learn math, geometry, science, uh, marketing, communication, all these different things. We're taught that. But what we are not really taught is to understand what it is we're responsible for, right? what it is that we can actually create, which is our thoughts, our actions, mm -hmm. our reactions, and our emotions. Yeah. This is it. This is what we are responsible for as human beings, thoughts, actions, reactions, emotions. And we're responsible for those every moment of every day. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what how we create our reality. This is the building blocks and the architecture of our experience is what thoughts we think today, what actions we take, how we actually emote and how we react and how we use all those in combination when we interact with situations. So that's something to be consciously aware of and to study yourself and how you are acting, how are you thinking, how are you emoting, right? So you just want to be in a, a state of observation and neutrality first to observe how you have been programmed on a subconscious level. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the two books I read when I started reading on my own and not assigned reading from school mm -hmm. was besides comic books. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll see that to the side. Besides mm -hmm. nerdy comic books, Spider-Man and that um, was the power of the subconscious mind and the one hour orgasm. Okay. And that was at 16. So understanding right away the subconscious mind in our own programming and, and being able to observe that. Now, to master the emotions, it does take a lot more work. To go from anger to happiness is a big jump. You know, to go from anger to, you know, neutrality is a little bit less of a jump. So trying to find situations where you can bring yourself to neutral consciously mm. when you're having an emotional experience, just see if you can get it to neutral. Just to breathe deep, observe yourself and like, oh, wow, I was really angry about that. Somebody cut me off in traffic. Can I just get back to neutral? I'll run the thought a couple more times. All right, that guy's a jerk, whatever. But let me just run that thought. Okay, you know what? Can I get back to neutral? When it doesn't matter, you know, when, when it's not as important. But can you, can you do that? And can you see yourself doing that and doing it successfully? Yeah. That still might be challenging. So we'll set that aside for an advanced exercise. Mm -hmm. But in the basic exercise is at first thing in the morning and the last thing at night is to breathe in 
and start with gratitude. Mm. Just absolute thankfulness and appreciation of given another day of existence to play, to have experiences, and to try out different things in life. Yeah. Even if it's the same routine that you've done for the last six years, you're given another day, maybe you can do it differently. You can think more thoughts today. Mm -hmm. You can interact with more people. You can have a Zoom call. You can reach out to someone on social media. You can mm -hmm. have some, something. You, there's something to you. If anybody's listening to this, there's something to be grateful for. Yeah. Right? The, you, there's something to be grateful for. So when you, when you have that and you can really sink into the feeling of gratefulness, of whatever it is. I have this computer, I have a phone, I can communicate. That's that's actually a good thing. Yeah, It feels good. I'm thankful for that because without that, that's not so good. I have running water and that that's that's my key right there. If I have running water, yeah. my gratitude goes through the roof. <laughs> Take away my running water and, and it, it significantly hinders. Yeah. You know, that's you. You know, going, going back to you know my, my village in, in Nigeria for the first time when I went I was like I will never be ungrateful again you I know. can wake up happy because I see people who are happy who mm -hmm. are fetching water and walking miles that you makes know. no sense that me in my air conditioned house in, in a major city who's you never know. been hungry who's never had to walk more than a block for water because there's a park nearby with running water you know no, this is, this is it. So starting with gratitude and really feeling it, not thinking it, it's feeling because the, what we want to do, right? The practical use of this is to become in tuned with our body systems. Our mm -hmm. emotional system is a system where we can have our sovereignty, meaning that our outside influences do not navigate us, but they give us inputs and we have control and connection internally to say, I take that input and now I'm given choice with how I want to guide. Yeah. So in order to be a little bit more masterful, practice would be to pause. Whenever you receive something, to consciously pause. So mm -hmm. this could be the very you know, start of the practice. Do the gratitude, try and feel happy and thankful, but have a pause. You get a text message, don't just reply two, three seconds. And just even that one, two, three, now I'm going to respond. Mm -hmm. right? The other practice that I use, you know, at least when we were traveling a little bit more and the world was a little bit more open was every time I would cross through a threshold of a portal, meaning a door, yeah. I would take a deep breath and see how do I want to proceed into the space. Mm -hmm. If I'm going from my kitchen, to my bedroom, that gives me acknowledgement. From my be bedroom to the bathroom, how do I want it? From the bathroom back out, opening up a window in a work environment, and I want to have a communication. Okay, yeah. I'm opening that email. How do I want to perceive that? Close that. Opening up a new one, how do I want to proceed? So just giving yourself three seconds, mm -hmm. two seconds, until you can get it to like one second, you're, you have a, your breath, a clear intention, and now you proceed. Yeah. Now you start having choice. Yeah. And that's what we want to create for ourselves is choice. That's choice powerful. In, totally. I hear you. Choice in how you show up and as such how you respond to what's being shown to you as well. Mm. The the gratitude journal has been a massive game changer for me a couple of years ago. And I now have um a daily. This is my my latest one. I'm just literally um yesterday. Uh, last night started a new one because the, the other one is finished five five minutes it takes in the morning five minutes it takes at night mm. and it, it's been um it's been so powerful that at time i actually fight against it you, you know what i mean when you want to stay powerful. pissed off <laughs> yeah, it's too powerful because at time let's be honest you want to stay pissed off you know i mean that person crossed you uh and i don't want to be gra grateful for the train taking me where i was supposed to now i'm remembering something else <laughs> but it's a beautiful exercise to simply be grateful for the for the simplest smallest things and go to bed or wake up in the morning with gratitude in your mind in your heart in your body as opposed to oh fuck another day um i'm hold this and so and so um and similar to you i remember the last time i was in guinea where my dad comes from 
um, I was staying with my auntie and she's lucky enough to have water, not hot water, just water. Mm -hmm. um, but the electricity just goes off. I don't know, <laughs> half, yeah. half the day, depending on what's happening in the area and everything else. And she's one of the few um, houses who's got running water. And one of the reasons for that is because she lives 10 minutes away from one of the ministers from the country. And as such, he had a pipeline, a mm. pipe of water. You know, I mean, you know, those ways where just depending on where you are situated, where your house is, you may get some, some, some running water. And just being grateful um, to be able to have a, um, a shower. It's not going to be a hot shower, but you're now becoming grateful just for having this water when you just turn it on. So when you come back, for me, it was Paris, London, being able to just then tap on simple things, which sounds silly. And this is why I think travel and traveling is very, very important. So I'm hoping the, uh, the realms are going to reopen for people to go out there and see how grateful they could actually be for what they've got. Mm. Thanks for reminding me of that. Oh, Can yeah. Can we can we go on to touch and talk about Definitely. touch and, and the value and, and, and the sacredness of it and how we can actually approach not only touching others, but also how to receive touch? Definitely. Um, yeah, there's so much that can be conveyed within a touch. Mm -hmm. there's, so, there's so much. Uh, when you're attuned, when you're attuned to it, right? Um, a lot of times we touch different things with a different consciousness. Right? Mm -hmm. We're not necessarily conscious how we're touching. We, we pet a dog, we pet a dog. We, we pet a cat a little bit different than how we pet a dog. Yeah. You know, there, there's these different ways that we touch. We have different consciousness about it. But touch is a channeling of information, right? There's a quantum amount of information that is communicated through touch. Right. And often the feminine is much more acutely aware of this than the masculine. Mm -hmm. Often, meaning that the receiver is often much more aware of it than the giver mm -hmm. right, when it comes to touch. So, you know, if, you, if you're touching and you, you don't know that, you know, somebody is sore or anything else, you can just touch them like, oh, I'm just going to touch you. But the receiver knows very well that you're not even paying attention and they can, they can wince back. They, yeah. they can feel uncomfortable. But touch is part of our communication as well as our emotional happiness and development. This is one of the reasons why, you know, 2020 was so hard for, for the globe. I used to meet people all over the world, you know, and, and uh, you know, put one of my many hats is working with artists and I would have artists and, and, you know, beautiful creative people all over the world that I would meet and I would hug in, in beautiful, loving friendship. Mm -hmm. And that went away. And that's a big part for me. Yeah. And for children, right. Children who are not rocked and they're not receiving touch actually do not develop fully as a human being the, the same way that those who actually do receive touch. Yeah. We we'll often see them rocking. You'll see other neurological disorders uh, and when it comes to development mm -hmm. where they, they, they need touch. Like that is actually part of our makeup. It is part of our species. Mm -hmm. And to remove that is to remove an essence of who we are. Yeah. You know, you can't take away um, a sense from a creature and, and expect it to be the same creature. Mm -hmm. It is a creature without. You know, if you take a dog and you remove the sense of smell from dogs, it's not the same experience as being a dog. Yeah. It's, it's a different experience. You know, it, it, I'm sure it has all its unique wonders, but it is a big component of it, just like touch is with us. Mm -hmm. So in conveying communication through touch, you can convey so many things with or without words. Right. So, for example, if you are in a state of grievance for a loss and someone comes by and lays a hand on your shoulder. You can feel that. They will transfer that love and support to you. Somebody who doesn't really care, they can be like, sorry, man, sorry about your loss. Hmm. And it feels awful. Yeah. And it feels awful. You don't even want to be touched by that person. Get away from me. Don't touch me. Right? Because what happens is there's a transference of energy there. 
So you can use touch to create bonds. You can use it to, to separate bonds, right? But this, this is a way of connection and sharing information. Mm. You know, many of the times, I, you know, as I teach, one of the things that I teach is touch specifically and, you know, teaching the different seven layers of touch and how to kind of work your way into the body and create deepening mm. through touch is you want to have consciousness connected with your touch. You don't want to just touch. And that's what uh, often females especially tell me that they experience is a man. He's not even present. He's just touching the body. Yeah. Where if you think about it, put all of your consciousness into your tip of your finger, right? And here's an exercise everybody can do just, just listen to it, right? So here I'm, I'm going to work with you on touch real quick. And this is what I do when I'm teaching with attention and to understand that and how consciousness moves within the body. So right now, just take a breath and relax. Everybody could just take a breath and relax. <sighs> And bring your awareness to your right big toe, All right? If you have socks on, feel what that feels like, All right? Feel what the temperature is like, feel that. Be aware of it. And just take another breath, relax. And now bring your attention to your right eyebrow. All right, and just feel that. Be aware of it. It's a bit different. Don't have a sock on it, you know, might have shoes on, whatever. And another breath and take that and move your attention to the tip of your nose. All right, and just be aware of it. And breathe. You can relax and just breathe now. But one of the things that happens is when you move your attention to that part of the body, it activates. We've been feeling our whole body the whole day, but your big toe finally got some attention and you know exactly what that feels like because our attention is often scattered, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's like a flashlight and it's just shining on everything. But when it comes to touch, as soon as you're touched, your attention, your attention goes right to that touch and that mm. area of touch. So not that, that happens for the receiver, right? So if you're just standing, you're just standing there, your attention's all over the place. If someone come, pokes you in the side of the neck, all of a sudden, all of your attention goes to, you know, that side of the neck. Or if it was a, you know, a, a fly, tiny little thing, but it just touches you. And you're just like, all of your attention goes right there and you, you're, you're brushing it off. Mm. So that's unconscious touch. It's just things that are coming into your field. When you're receiving, you're going to be acutely aware of that, right? If your mind is relaxed, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't have armor up and we can talk about that if you'd like, but it's important for the person who's giving the touch to move their attention to their hands, their mouth, any part of their body that they're touching with so that they can bring consciousness and connectivity to their touch. Mm -hmm. When you can do that, now you're making a connection and the person receiving that is going to know that they're going to know you're actually present with your touch versus that you're just putting your hands on me. Yeah. Right. And that creates immediate intimacy, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between just shaking hands with somebody and shaking hands, slowly looking at them and feeling that taking a moment to actually feel that they feel you mm -hmm. or hugging, like taking that moment. There's so many things that we do routinely that aren't tantric in nature, that don't weave in our consciousness, that don't bring together that moment of true connection. They're mm -hmm. just autopilot. So that's what to me is, is being more tantric in our existence is weaving that in to create more connection. Everything that we do, just bringing more intention and more consciousness of our own that we put into that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, true. I, I find myself repeatedly, uh, both myself and others, that touch is uh, not only a form of knowledge, but it's also a, a method of communication, both expressing, but also listening. And from time to time, some of us miss one aspect whilst very strong on the other. We know how to touch, but not as a listening form, more as mm -hmm. a, this, this is what I want, or this is what I'm taking. Very, very interesting. Um, can I possibly ask you about the concept of, you mentioned it briefly, but I want to, 
ask because I know very little about it as well. Armoring and de-armoring in terms of a tantric practice. What does it mean? And how does it work? What do you do? Yeah, definitely. So armoring is something usually done unconsciously and it's a response to trauma, mm-hmm. right? So when the body receives um, multiple traumas, like let's say the skin, for example, I used to do gymnastics and we would build up calluses or weightlifting. You would build up calluses as you would get, you know, small traumas again and again, tears and, and breaks in the skin. You start building up calluses and that creates a, a certain type of armor for you. Or if a bone breaks, it, you know, where it broke, it grows back stronger. Mm-hmm. That's the same thing that happens within our neurological system of our nervous system. When we experience emotional traumas, we can start getting armored up too many heartbreaks right? And now we don't want to open up. So these emotional wounds sit within our nervous system. Hmm. They, they, they actually sit within our body and you can see people and it changes their physiology. You might see somebody who walks kind of hunched over or, or, or looking over their shoulder and they don't feel open hearted because their heart has contracted because it, it feels so tight from the different emotional things that happened within the, you know, within their emotional system. Mm-hmm. So the things that happen to our emotional system and our etheric system eventually make their ways into our bodies. <clears throat> it eventually manifests into the physical. So one of the things within that space is to become more aware of it. Yoga, like you mentioned, you've been yoga for years, is a masterful practice of opening and expanding and connection and creating space within the body. You know, I spent years training as an athlete, but I didn't understand my core and some of those deeper inner interconnected parts of myself until I was taking yoga, you know, and I was performing at, you know, a high level athlete and and a collegiate athlete in in American football. And I was like, what, how did I miss all this? How how did they not tell me these different things? Um, So to be aware of yourself, right. To be aware that you are taking wounds. And when you have a wound, it's one thing not to always hold back the tears. Right. Mm -hmm. So tears are, are important. And they're, it's, they, they form for a reason. They actually have a negative ion. They have a negative charge. Yeah. It's literally negativity leaving the body. There's some people who haven't cried for years about subjects that they should have cried that one day and maybe for three days nonstop. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've, I've worked with somebody who was um, a woman who was going through a divorce and, and, and in it with her, her children and was having a really rough time. And And just talking with her, she was trying to move forward with this big business and everything else. And, you know, just feeling into her. I just asked her if she cried. And she's like, no, you know, I'm trying to get rid of, you know, I'm trying to get this going. You know, I have a lot of stuff on the place. And I was like, wait, you haven't, you haven't cried? Hmm. These, these horrible things have happened to you. You're going through these hard times. You, You feel disconnection from your children. You feel disconnected from this relationship. You're, you're moving into this whole new space and you want to just dive into creating a business mm-hmm. and you haven't even cried yet. She said, no, I was like, well, my recommendation, you know, is from human to human in this situation mm-hmm. would be to go home, cancel everything and take three days and cry as much as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And she said, I could do that. That was her response. Interesting. <laughs> I could do that. I said, without question Mm -hmm. that that is something that not only can you do it should be done these emotions that you've carried for years these these traumas that you're going through you're not able to release and now you're trying to go into business and work with other people from this state Mm -hmm. that is going to affect you personally and affect everybody that you're connected with yeah you know you have to empty your emotional cup to be filled with that, which what you want to be filled with. And right now you're filled with sorrow and you're trying to transmute that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a big transmutation that, you know, even for me looking at, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm not going to breathe through that. I'm going to cry through that. Like for me, I'm going to cry. Like, Mm -hmm. and and I've been studying, you know, these emotional techniques, but yeah. So it's under understanding these different tools. Yeah. And, And some, some of that is, is moving the energy through tears, working with the body, becoming aware of what is built up, what is keeping you from opening up Mm -hmm. because you've been observing yourself. You know what it's like when you're happy. You can see that you're not. And when you're not, 
is a time for you to know that I need to do something to open back up. Yeah. Right. And if you're around loving people, you have loving friends or, you know, loving professionals that you can communicate with somebody that, to communicate with and yeah. say, Hey, you know, I'm having a problem opening up. Your friends are going to you know, help you like, Hey, let's, let's go out. Let's do something. Let's just talk a little bit more. You know, I'll check in on you this week, mm. just something. So you can start feeling that. And it might be heartbreak. And that that's a little bit different in intimacy, but that's something also when you're in the meeting stages with people, instead of moving to intimacy and those other things to be able to communicate that because somebody who's loving and somebody who's capable of, of trying to create deeper intimacy that cares about you will acknowledge that. And that acknowledgement of your pain and your suffering and your traumas in and of itself creates a gateway for it to be released. Yeah. Right. So that, those are some things to, once again, just acknowledge that they're there and work with them. Do not avoid them. <clears throat> you, you don't want to sit in them for years. You don't want to just like make it part of your story, but you want to process them, actively work with them until you have a working relationship with the events of your life. Mm -hmm. This was horrible. I hated it. You know, I worked with it. I did a lot of meditation. I did some yoga. I did therapy, whatever it was for you. I took a vacation. I came back. I was recharged. I look at it. I still don't like what happened but I'm coming at it from a place where it doesn't move me into that negative emotional state when I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the key where have I all said 14 years ago, my dad passed away and it took me four years to shed a tear. And I love my dad dearly, but I, I four, four years. Yeah. Wow. Four years where I, I somehow refused. I refused um, to acknowledge the fact that it was gone. I refused that we were very close and that he was perhaps the only person I felt at the time who could really understand me. Mm. I, I refused to deal with all those things. And it took, I used to have dreadlocks. Um, believe it or not, I'm bald now, but my hair was actually below my bum, <laughs> below my ass. So I, I, I've I had long hair and uh, one day, um, because I started to see the boldness appearing, appearing at the top of my head, I went for a shave and it was the, um, it was the, 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 the key to unlocking quite a lot of stuff. And it was the shedding of an old skin and also the wow. appreciating. And it was me. I quite literally felt like I was becoming a man finally. And it was also acknowledged my dad being gone and crying for, I wasn't crying for my hair. I was crying for for my dad just I was four years late <laughs> yeah it was just trapped right it was just stuck it was the trapped. Body. and, and the hair holds that too the hair holds all, all those different charges it does it does so fast forward to four years ago when my little sister uh, passed away I knew not to do the same I knew mm. not to do the same I, I came back home from where I was and I spent the, you know a good two weeks just processing and, and, and accessing those feelings and those emotions and that anger. And, and I, I knew not to do the same thing and to hold on to everything because it was going to affect me, not just mentally, but also physically Yeah, I was doing so for my dad did in terms of my spine and everything else. So I'm there with you totally learn, learn to handle, accept and appreciate that those emotions that really need to be, to be shared, shared somehow. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Let us, let us, can we talk about sex? <laughs> let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. Let's, let's talk about sex. Baby. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, re <laughs> I'm reading, uh, I'm rereading um, Think and Grow Rich and I'm hmm. on the chapter on sex and sublimation. 13? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm 43 now and it's basically talking to people of my age around there where we start to, uh, to somehow have an handle on our sexual life and our sexual energy and how we can perhaps transcend and we should in order to sublimate that sexual en energy into something that can be useful in other places than the bedroom. So um, no particular question for you, but since you know the book and you know what I'm hinting at, what what is your experience of that personally and then with your coaches and people that you work with yeah, definitely i mean this this is something that is you know talked about and actually part of the the study within cosmic sexuality itself mm -hmm. right so within that <clears throat> and napoleon hill 
talks about, you know, sex and sublimation and basically the transmutation. This gets into alchemy as well of yeah. moving sexual energy from the creation of life within, you know, the womb going through the sexual chemical processes to transmuting it into a creative business process or, or other things that you want to create in your life. So if you look at sex energy and Kundalini energy as creative life force, Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of just a sexual energetic. Mm -hmm. Right. So creation is an act of sex. It is. This is yeah. a creation. Something is birthed. I have an idea that I'm bringing to life, life, any of these creative things, there is birthing. Right. And it's just about where you're channeling the energy. Right. And for the masculine and feminine, and I'll be doing a whole longer in-depth communication on this there, there's we have to work counterintuitive to some of our uh, natural impulses right and for men it's often in the form of semen retention mm -hmm. right it's it's non-ejaculation where we're moving the energy up from our testicles and into our solar plex and into our power center or into our heart or into our mind, opening up our, our third eye or our crowns connecting with, you know, divinity. There's a lot of different ways to be able to move that energy. But when we are constantly expelling our seed and our cerebral spinal fluid through our semen, we are moving our consciousness, moving our energy out. Mm -hmm. This is a way to out. And, and you often notice that when a man, you know, ejaculates, he's looking for rest and reprieve. It's like, and, and, and expel, you're expelling a great amount of energy, mm -hmm. right? That, that's one of the things that happens. So it's counterintuitive, you know, for us, but it's something that creates a lot of uh, energy and power is to retain and, and to hold back, right? So this is one of the things with the masculine that is often uh, found very attractive from fe the feminine as well, is the ability to retain power, mm -hmm. is to hold power. You can hold back an ocean, right? Somebody just letting it go, like, yeah, that's not a thing. Women also in sex, right? Are you looking for a man to push through and ejaculate in a hurry. Most women are like, absolutely not. They mm -hmm. want to feel a man holding back for hours, if it can be, like feeling that power and that creative force within him and his ability to hold that is something that women, in my experience, have found extremely attractive is a man being able to hold power, mm -hmm. right? And, and that creative force is power. Right. And, it's, and it can be transmuted to other things. Now, on the contrary, this is, a, um, you know, for women, it's often women are retracting and pulling in and contracting, right? They're contracting inwards and holding back. But when a woman can actually push through, right, this is where the birthing of something new come, comes in. When women are giving labor and birthing, they're not told, okay, pull in, pull in, pull in. No, it's they're told to push, right? Which is a different thing that they're used to um, when uh, you know I help teach women to ejaculate. It's like, okay, learn how to push with the vagina that instead of just contract. There's there's different ways to actually move the energy, right? So for every muscle, right? We have one that's contracting this way, but we have another one that contracts in the opposite way. Mm -hmm. Can you work with both flows of energy? Are you aware of how to use that within your own body, right? Uh, same thing for um, women who are in communication with a man and they don't want to offend, right? They don't want to say something is wrong. So what happens is they hold back. They Here they are in doing the contracting, where in this case, pushing through that uncomfortability to say, hey, you know what I would really like, or it doesn't feel really good to me, that would be great if this was different, yeah. all of a sudden changes the entire course of their relationship because they push through. Where a man who might've gotten upset about something and could have you know, changed his whole relationship because he just let out his anger, he actually holds back and the situation resolves itself. And he sees that you know, a woman was just going through one of her, her different, many emotional energetic phases and it just needed to actually burn out. And now mm -hmm. they can connect. But if he just didn't hold back, 
it would have changed the entire course. So these are the, the essences of the Kundalini and that life force polarity of the alpha and omega and the masculine feminine energies that we can harness into creativity. Mm -hmm. So it's learning how to actually do that and hold back as a masculine to cultivate your internal power and to hold that, to be able to feel all that sexual desire, but not move to it, but to be able to hold that and mm -hmm. emanate that right, and radiate that. And for a woman to not just shy away from some of her things, but to actually open up to them and to blossom, you know? Yeah. 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 Wow. Quite a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> it takes a bit yeah. of work. Yeah, I, it's a lifetime I, of study. Totally. I'm still getting there. <laughs> I remember I was a, a bass player. I was a musician for 15 years. Um, and uh, I remember speaking with one of my bass teachers about something related to that. He didn't use those terms, but it was a case of Anytime you feel the need to somehow have sex, make love, whatever you name it, Rafan, grab your bass and transmute and bring this energy into your playing. And I'm not going to lie to you. I was, I was in my twenties at a time. He made me laugh out loud. I, and I said to him, are you serious? He said, yes, you come to me for private lessons. I was seeing him outside of, I did my degree in music, but I was seeing him for privates. And he said, yes, you, you came here for private lessons f f to, to learn about my secrets. Uh, you know, you know, you got to spend the, the time and the hours on the instrument and, you know, walk your scales and techniques and all those things. But there is something else to it. There is something else to it. It's how you approach the instrument and what you approach the, your instrument with that is going to make a massive, massive difference in your musicianship. How can you possibly bring all of you and since I can sense that you are a central person, you might as well make your playing a central thing. Now, fast forward to 2005, when I first became a yoga teacher. Somebody, I was on a podcast, I was a, I was a guest on a, on a podcast last week, and someone said, and the lady asked me, what is the best advice, advice you've ever been given? And I used to see someone who had been a yoga teacher for much longer than myself. She was good. And she came to a class one day and uh, it was one of my very first class, but it was a busy class. Um, something like 40 or 50 people there. And I was, I was shitting myself. But anyhow, so I turned into this boot camp instructor. And um, the following day she came to see me and she said, look, Rafan, I know you're not going to listen to me, but I'm going to give it to you nonetheless. Teach the way you make love. And I, again, I, I giggled and laughed and said, no, I'm not going to listen to that. But over the years, I've learned that the more I allow myself to tap into my sensuality whilst retaining that power without letting go of it, the better I not only teach, but also tap and move people. Um, and that's been something quite, quite important in anything that I do now, where I feel myself to be a fairly sensual, if not sexual person. I don't know whether I am hypersexual, but I know that sex has been a, a, a major component of my life. But now it's been, I wouldn't say 10 years or so, where I always try to gather that in a way that is both creative and artistic. And something that I don't try to somehow, as you said, push externally, but 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 cultivate internally in order to to manifest something that is fueled by it, but doesn't necessarily come out of sex. Yeah. So yeah. But that's and that by itself is tantric in nature, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where we, we talk about as as far as tantra and the weaving. It's the weaving of that intimate, sexual, sensual energy into your life, right? So for me, I carry my sexual energy with me as well. Mm -hmm. I love and I, I connect with people as they are, like in the moment. If I hug somebody I've never met for the first time, it's still with a huge open heart. Like mm -hmm. it's somebody that I've been waiting to meet my entire life is how I meet new people. Mm -hmm. and, and that 
allows me to to feel a connection in a different way than if I was already spent. Sexual energy is already done. I'm kind of tired. Like, okay, I'm always just expelling myself. No, it's, you know, many times it's, you know, months on end that, you know, I'm retaining. It's, there's, it's held within. So I have a constant radiance of a live creative energy. And I do a lot of different things. I work, I work in a lot of different creative spaces. So mm-hmm. it's important. And, and you can feel such a difference. I mean, women know it very well when they, when they see a man, you know, ejaculate a couple times, you know, it's like, okay, how well is the connection after that? Point? <laughs> you know, where's his energy like? You know, where with women, it's once again, it's the inverse. It's like the more they do it, they open up this river and this flow where, where they're moving. So it's, mm. it's a bit different. It, it usually opens up their creativity, where with a man, it, um, it depletes their creativity. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Let me ask you this question, actually. What is the best advice a lover has ever given you? Hmm. It's very funny because I've been in the teaching role so, so frequently I know. Um, just because I started at such a young age. Mm-hmm. So I haven't received much instruction. So I would say it's not, if here, here's what I'll give you. This, this is what I can give you that it's instruction, but I think it's just communication from the feminine. Right. Yeah. And it's just the, the, the inner standing that I received from the feminine of how connected they are to us, right? As men, especially if we're intimate with them as women, their intuition and their sensitivity to touch and our electromagnetic field, especially entering a woman, Mm -hmm. becomes very attuned to the man that they're entering, where if we are entering a woman and we have that connection. And, you know, especially if you are in a natural state, skin to skin, you know, and you have that intimate connection, your interactions with other people, especially if there's anything else intimate, if you're dating multiple people or being intimate, they will be able to feel and it will have an effect on their system. Because what happens is when you merge sexually, your systems are trying to harmonize. They're trying to harmonize. And for for the masculine who's constantly projecting energy, we might not necessarily be acutely aware of how connecting to these other energies affects how we're connected to another one. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing for me has been reflections of from the feminine, even if I'm not, you know, being sexual with someone, but how another feminine energy is affecting me. And if, 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 it, if I'm getting the feedback, you know, and this is only from, you know, very well deep trusted friends that are, are from the feminine that might be able to pick on these subtle nuances mm-hmm. of understanding how you're changing. Right. And so this is one thing that I would, you would share, you know, to the masculine out there is have really good female friends. See if you can actually have them. I know often we have female friends that we want to sleep with, which are great but Mm -hmm. also have some that can actually talk to you because you will be able to get insight into the feminine experience or the female body experience, what they're able to pick up because they have more finely, acutely attuned intuition and sensitivity to energy Mm -hmm. because they're receiving all the time where we're often projecting. So my thing is to be able to develop that greater understanding of the connectivity. And that's something that, you know, even in the last, you know, five years after decades of study have really come to understand because so much of what's taught in Tantra is in the one-on-one space and in sacred sexuality is in the one-on-one space. Mm -hmm. But for people who are dealing with open relationships where many people are now or swingers or lifestyles of any type, they're dealing with a lot of different energies or people who are dating multiple people. They're dealing with different energies and you need to learn how to be able to communicate, to harmonize between the people that you're connecting with. Otherwise get ready for reality TV. Yeah. That's <laughs> just get ready for It's just not drama. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Reality TV. Get ready for that because there's going to be a lot of nonsense happening. It's just drama because what drama, happens. Yeah. And, and then, you know, being absolutely honest which is very vulnerable for the masculine when you have agenda and you're mm-hmm. not clear. Um, I tend to be clear, but it, it's still, even in my communication, 
there's additional clarification for the feminine. One of the worst things that I found that you can do for the masculine, this hurts everybody when it's done, is lie to a woman about something that she bring up that is a flag or something that she's feeling in her system. Yeah. Right. What happens is, and this is the story that I've seen happen, you know, throughout time and memorial and happens today. A woman's feeling off about something, comes to a man about it, who's trying to negotiate a relationship with another woman, starting it, or maybe already might be intimate. And then he tells the woman that she's just being paranoid, trying to dismiss her intuition and all the different signals that she's actually feeling within her body. And he might try and negate it to, to something else or negotiate her to some something else until she compromises to think that maybe she's off with something instead of being strong enough. And this is to me where partnership comes in mm -hmm. is you're strong enough to be able to help strengthen her intuition. Yeah. Right. Are you a man that's strong enough to uplift and strengthen those around you? Right. If you're going to be able to do something, you should be able to do it and be proud of it and communicate it clearly. Like, look, I'm I'm not looking to settle down. I am looking to date. I am looking to have multiple intimate partners. If you're strong enough to do that, then do that. And that's what you want to do. Communicate it clearly and honestly. Mm -hmm. If you cannot acquire it honestly, right, in those different spaces, then you don't need to be doing it. Right. There, there's that's, there's not a truth to you in that. You're chasing an experience. You're not resonating with what is your true, honest self. You're just chasing something externally. Instead of saying, this is who I am, either you accept me and resonate with me, yeah. but I'm not going to change who I am for this person. I'm going to change who I am for that person. I might behave in a more open space with this person because it's more fun. I might be more conservative with that person, but who I am and what I value, I'm going to be very clear on. So it takes a significant amount of strength to uplift those around you, especially if it's calling you out on something. So in that, I encourage all men to be honest. If you're going to be, you know, non-committed, if you're in a non-committed relationship, if a woman's fine, you know, sensing anything and you're feeling her pull away, go ahead and dive in and be like, no, what is it? Talk to me. What are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know what? I did start talking with this other woman. Maybe it's that. Is that what you're feeling? Yeah, it's something like that. Okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested. Have the discussions. Like, yeah. this is the adult part of adult dating, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't childhood dating. This is mm -hmm. adults, right? So approach it as a man of power and respect and responsibility for yourself and be able to communicate that. Where a woman now, from that, she's like, oh, okay, I can feel safer. <clears throat> you're not lying to me about it. I can at least, I might not like it. Yeah. But now I can have a discourse and I can make, I can make a, a choice and she might yeah. choose to still be with you or she can say, you know what, I'm looking for something different and, and give her that opportunity, but don't diminish or try and injure her intuition. And now she goes around and now every time she connects with the next man, it's going to be off for her. Don't do that. That, yeah. that hurts us all collectively. It so does, this is yeah. something that we can do to empower each other in the masculine feminine um, relational dynamics. Mm hmm. Mm, thank you for this. One final question is, I want to, I want us to talk about the sacred space, which you, you've given us a beautiful segue into it, which is that the marrying of the masculine and the feminine and how one can help the other. And I, I, I'd like us to go also with the gender aspect as what you just said in terms of male and female, but also talk about feminine and masculine in terms of the forces and how walking together from an honest, authentic place, both men and women using their feminine and masculine strengths can actually build something that can be called sacred as opposed to um, basic. Yeah, very true. Uh, basic and mundane. Um, there has to be a, a desire to experience relationship on a different level. It all mm -hmm. starts with the desire, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to have an agenda, have it be that. If I, if I was going to give somebody an agenda, it would be have a clear desire to experience something greater in the world of relating. Mm -hmm. So from an early age, I've observed, you know, my parents' relationship and I saw the world around me and this was, I was 12 years old and I saw that and I, I looked around and I was like, wow, you know, there's been stories of the perfect man from Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad within different cultures and perfect women from Athena and Hera and goddesses. And, but there hasn't been, you know, really too many stories within this culture of the perfect relationship. And, 
you know, at that time I heard a really specific voice within me say, that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. And within that came to the understanding that the purpose of the masculine and feminine is to work together to create. Mm -hmm. These are the creative forces in the universe, but how we're creating isn't conscious and it isn't from a base of a shared vision of love. It often isn't, right? It's, it's creating as a result of attraction, creating as a result of certain desires, but the desire isn't this deeper cosmic divine connection, hmm. right? So <clears throat> when you approach relationship from the mundane, you're, you're looking to experience sex, you often can get that. But what happens is, the man, especially after having sex, is looking for something else. He's looking for someone else after having sex several different times or several different ways. He's looking for someone else. The woman is looking for a deeper commitment often. These are traditional roles. Yeah. The oxytocin, serotonin, these things start kicking in. And she's looking, she's feeling more vulnerable, more open. She wants more commitment to hold her through that. Very natural things. But what's not happening is a conversation about how can we improve each other's life? What role can we play in each other's life that will help empower you to be the greatest version and even greater than you were without your partner? Mm. Right. And that's the place that I, I encourage people to go in relationship. I'm not looking for someone to be my equal. I'm looking for someone to be my complement, my catalyst, someone that isn't worn out by being around me, but is their natural self. And it improves everything that I do. And that's what my expectation of anybody that I'm around, I see myself as a catalyst, you know, within the world of chemistry. And you talk about chemistry, people are like, oh, they have chemistry. Well, the chemistry that I like is a substance that can be added to another of reaction that speeds up or enhances that reaction in some way, but is not depleted itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to look at in being for each other, right? And, and when you have that in partnership, it is magic. And, I, and I've gotten to experience that. And it is absolute magic. As a man, when you have a woman by your side, you know, as, as, a, as a strong ma masculine man who's on purpose, who, who's trying to create in this world, when you have a woman by, his, by your side that you feel is a catalyst to you, you feel you can walk through fire and you will mm -hmm. for your family, for your purpose, for Ed, to, to, to be able to help and assist. And it doesn't burn. Yeah. It doesn't burn. You, you can just walk through it. There's an energetic essence that raises your vibration, these fears, these insecurities, all that's gone away because that component of you, that feminine component, you are received, you are trusted, right? And these are things that are really big for people to understand. For a man, one of the, the strongest things that he can hear, one of the most beautiful things for, to hear from a woman, it's not the words, I love you, mm -hmm. all right? I love you is nice. It's very nice. You, you can love a dog. You, you can love a cat. <laughs> you love these different people. No. The big word to hear from the feminine to say to a masculine, when you, when you think you found a man that you really want to be with, say these words, look deeply in his eyes and say, I trust you. I absolutely trust you. Meaning I trust the decisions you make. I trust the man that you are. I trust the way that you live. I trust that you have my best interest in heart. Mm -hmm. I trust that you're going to show up for me. When a man can feel that from a woman, that raises him. It puts him in a state of being a leader. Yeah. You know, these people trust me. This is where I protect the women and children. It brings out my protector. It brings out my guardian. It brings out my leader. No, these, these, are, my, these are my people. They trust me. They're mm. entrusting me. And that brings about a certain thing. And for a man to love a woman, that's where a woman to hear, I love you. In, in, a, in a space, not just like, I love you like a friend or anything, but I love you as a partner. I love you as this essence of creation that draws me to you, that I'm enamored with, right? To be able to feel that and she can feel held in that love, right? And for the masculine, the two forces in this, the masculine is to hold this structured container that she can trust, that's what you are creating alchemically is this container where she now can be wild and free and open and bloom and blossom and flow in all countless ways and feel held by you. Mm -hmm. 
right? And in that, she can trust, the more she can trust your strength, that you can hold her, that you will be there, that you are not afraid of her emotions, her ups and downs, that you are consistent, that you are strong. She, and you encourage her to be even wilder, to be even more of herself, to create more, to fully express, to not hold back. And in that, you get to enjoy the expansion of woman into a much more wild, natural, beautiful, ever expanding essence than, than we know women to be now. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we get a chance to play with that move us into this cosmic space that move us into this divine space where relationship isn't something like, Oh yeah, that's the old ball and chain. Mm -hmm. That is my wife. And I resonate on the highest order of being when I think of her, mm -hmm. when I think of her, I can't help but smile. I bring, it brings tears to my eyes and it warms my heart when I think of her, mm. right? And this is my husband and he will walk through fire for this family. Yeah. And you can show me a thousand men making a thousand times more than him, but none of them will love me and take care of me deeply in my spirit. They might be able to provide more, but they will never provide more for my heart and my spirit the way that this man provides for me. This is what we can, this is what we can aspire to is to live and to feel that connection. That's so powerful, yeah. but it takes a lot of surrender and it takes a lot of strength. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I feel you. I'm grateful, Matthias. Thank you so, so very much for all of that. Amazing. Beautiful. Thanks very, very much. Everyone listening the various books and the various people that Matthias and perhaps even myself have mentioned will be in the show notes. Um, and something tells me I'm going to invite Matthias um, to speak with me again. Um, and if he's up for it, we'll have a part two. It would be a pleasure. It'd yeah, definitely be a pleasure. I mean, if anybody wants to reach and learn more, you can connect with me. It's just Matthias on Matola at Instagram. I don't post much yet. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is this is my resting time. I've been on many interviews, people who know me, you know, I, I've, I've done many different interviews, but I keep it pretty intimate. Yeah. You know, there will be a time where I'll be, be stepping out, but it's only when I'm called right now because I'm still doing a lot of the traditional stuff, still getting the information. And I share when I'm called, you know, to be in service and to have one on one you know, consultation and things like that. As those who are called to me through MasteringTantra.com. Um, but outside of that, you know, I'm, I'm here and I love to communicate. These are, these are things that are passionate to me. This is mm -hmm. part of my soul's path and purpose, and I'll be doing a lot more in the future. So anytime you want me, brother, just call me. I'll be here and be of service. Um, awesome to hear. You will be called again by me, that's for sure. So you've heard it, people. Masterintentra.com. All right. See you very soon. Speak to you all very soon. Thanks for listening to the Sweet Blasphemy podcast. And remember to make your life central, sexual, and pretty much and very much sacred as well. All right. Take care.